So I'm Dominic Malone. I'm the uh, Richard Brown Baker Curator of Contemporary Art. And I wanted to present tonight a work by a Chicago artist who passed away in uh, 1977. Um, her name is Gertrude Abercrombie. And it's a work, Interior with Pitcher, Rose, and Glove, uh, from about 1954. Um, I'll advance it to show what I hope. There we go. Uh, Gertrude. Um, all of my images are pitched on the left of your screen, so if you want to move everybody, you know, maybe to the right of your screen. Um, Gertrude Abercrombie is an artist uh, who uh, was born in uh, 1909 in Austin to um, traveling opera singers. Um, and uh, they eventually moved to Berlin, but with the advent of World War I, had to move uh, back to the States and uh, settled eventually in Chicago in Hyde Park, which is where uh, Abercrombie uh, spent most of her life. Uh, Hyde Park in Chicago is uh, the home of the University of Chicago and is really a, a, a very well known for being this uh, very bohemian, very intellectual sort of atmosphere. And so as an artist, she really kind of developed um, her early uh, life in uh, this very kind of heady uh, uh, location. Um, here's the painting. Um, and she studied uh, romance languages originally at the University of Illinois, uh, downstate in Illinois, uh, moving on to um, doing some uh, life study classes at the Art Institute and then eventually uh, doing some uh, studies at the American Academy of Arts, uh, much more of a kind of, uh, you know, more of a applied art training school. Um, and it was here where she really, you know, learned illustration, which um, she then parlayed into a job uh, doing illustration for the Mesero department store uh, in uh, Chicago, focusing on gloves. So um, appropriately enough, you see uh, sort of the, um, pardon the pun handiwork, uh, of her commercial uh, job being folded into this uh, beautiful and very little uh, surrealistic work. Um, her work uh, is done in this very, here's me beaming about uh, getting this painting at an art fair. Um, her work is, is very much uh, done to this very small scale always uh, done with these um, very significant sort of frames. The frames, you know, are, are very much as much a part of the work as, as the work itself. Uh, but it's really much, uh, very much uh, in keeping with her style. She begins to really focus uh, like solely on art in 1932. And um, is really, you know, kind of starts doing these figurative works um, that have a very surrealistic uh, bent to them. I'll get the, to that in a, in a moment. Um, but always figurative, always kind of focusing uh, at first on her herself, a lot of self-portraits. Um, she was a very sort of tall, she didn't consider herself a very attractive person, but um, obviously I think wanted to kind of focus on her and her own kind of, uh, she I actually kind of played up this sort of witchy uh, sort of appearance that she had. She was she was very much a, a very um, outlandish, eccentric kind of individual uh, character, and so she really depicts herself as such in uh, in works from the the forties and fifties. Um, I wanted to to read a, a quote of hers, you know, kind of going back to uh, the work on our collection. Um, I am not interested in complicated things, nor in the commonplace. I like to paint, I like and like to paint simple things that are a little strange. My work comes directly from my inner consciousness and it must come easily. It is a process of selection and reduction. Um, so it really is this, you know, uh, kind of life of the mind that she's uh, presenting in her work. These little scenes that are very intimate, that kind of draw you in uh, with their small scale and their intimacy. Um, and always have this very dry, kind of understated uh, strangeness about them. Um, I think it's really significant that she develops in Chicago because Chicago really develops a passion uh, in terms of not only um, the museums, but also collectors uh, for surrealism, uh, beginning in, in the mid-century, mid-20th century. Here is, actually, it's maybe my favorite painting ever. It's um, the one I loved as a kid going to see at the Art Institute of Chicago, 
Rene Magritte's Time Transfixed uh, from 1938. And Abercrombie doesn't really talk about many other artists, but Magritte is one that she really held in, in great esteem. And you can really kind of see uh, that sort of very subtle, dry, um, understated uh, kind of quality, but, but with an element of strangeness uh, that comes out in her work. And so, but Chicago, you know, really becomes this, this uh, city that embraces uh, uh, surrealism. Uh, collectors uh, like the great collector Ruth Horowitz, but others like Ed and Lindy Bergman and Joe and Jory Shapiro, whose work you can see, whose, whose collections you can see at the Art Institute now, um, really developed this, this flair for collecting uh, surrealism. And they were doing it in the 40s and 50s when New York collectors were really um, immersing themselves in abstract expressionism. Um, and, and different uh, moments in art. And so Chicago collectors kind of go in and, and, and really uh, collect uh, surrealism in this very strong and passionate way. And that really kind of influences um, artists like Abercrombie uh, and others, uh, Carl Worsom, another uh, Chicago artist in the museum's collection who kind of takes uh, from a different um, strain of surrealism um, but it's really something that I think defines art um, in Chicago in the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s. Uh, Carl Worsom, part of the Harry Who that emerged in the late uh, 1960s. Uh, Chicago also has this group called the Monster Roster, including Leon Golub, um, Richard uh, 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 Cohen, who um, these artists who really um, push the figure in a way and, and push these strange uh, permutations of the figure in a different way. And so Abercrombie is very much a part of this, this kind of moment in, Chi in Chicago art that looks at the strange, that looks at the surreal. Uh, but within the museum's uh, collection, uh, we decided that she would be a really pivotal figure to, to bring in um, to complement other artists who were, uh, particularly women artists, who were um, uh, uh, em embracing surrealism uh, at the same time. Uh, a figure like Leonora Carrington, an English artist with Mexican citizenship, uh, this recent acquisition, Stella Sneed and her cat. Um, we're really trying to kind of look at the 20th century and, and see where the gaps are, see where we need to kind of put some connective tissue, particularly with women artists, and as I'll indicate later, um, artists of color through, through this history. And so um, Gertrude's work, kind of follows on um, uh, these uh, other figures, uh, uh, Leonard Carrington, but also uh, Louise Bourgeois. Um, this is a bit of a later uh, work. She, uh, Bourgeois starts to work in the 40s and 50s as well. And so um, she really is, is someone who kind of finds herself within the museum collection alongside uh, these other figures. Um, when I was uh, playing the kind of intro music, I deliberately chose uh, Dizzy Gillespie. Um, Dizzy Gillespie was one of many uh, jazz musicians that uh, Gertrude Abercrombie uh, kind of welcomed to Chicago. Her um, second husband was a music critic. And so through him, she began to really kind of um, be introduced to this incredible array of avant-garde figures. Uh, in Chicago, uh, not only artists, but but jazz musicians and others as well. And so uh, there you see her on the left with, with Sonny Rollins. And um, she really becomes almost a, a, a sort of pivotal uh, central point. I think she referred to herself as the other Gertrude, uh, the other Gertrude being Gertrude Stein, who herself uh, built this incredible uh, kind of uh, entourage and, and, and circle around her in the modern era of Hemingway and, and Picasso and others. And Abercrombie becomes that kind of Gertrude Stein figure in Chicago, really drawing uh, this incredible, uh, you know, bohemian array of artists uh, into her circle. Uh, and so, you know, even though I think her own legacy kind of remains a bit muted until the, the mid seventies, just about the time of her death, um, she becomes this really uh, incredible focal point for the cultural scene in Chicago uh, up until uh, until then. So, but I think the jazz uh, connection is is not immaterial because um, Abercrombie's work within the museum's collection 
also kind of fits really well alongside figures like Aaron Douglas, um, an artist who begins to is working uh, roughly contemporary uh, with uh, Abercrombie, this incredible piece, Building More Stately Mansions. Um, but even though I think you don't quite get the jazz sensibility with Abercrombie's work that you get in some ways with, with Douglas, who does some other work that directly uh, uh, is, is, an, is, is influenced by jazz, but you know, Bob Thompson, uh, a figure whose work we just uh, acquired, um, an artist who is very much immersed in the New York jazz scene, uh, figures like Sonny Rollins, Dizzy Gillespie, but also uh, Archie Shepp and, and Ornette Coleman and others. Um, Thompson, who brings figurative art, this sort of uh, modernist, you know, kind of carrying over Matisse and other faux artists, German expressionism. I think with Abercrombie, it's not a, a, a sort of literal influence of jazz, but it's that kind of liberation, that sort of freedom uh, to experiment that comes out of jazz that is very much, I think, becomes part of her own personality, uh, but also feeds into her own uh, sort of work and life as an artist uh, as well. Um, kind of going back to the picture, um, it's funny, it, it was an interesting acquisition for me because my Department of Contemporary Art is um, is really defined by 1960 to the present, um, but I've you know tried to become a bit more involved in working with our uh, curator of painting and sculpture, Maureen O'Brien, who handles everything from medieval through modern. Uh, to think about those artists who really transition from the modern in, into the contemporary, and um, with Abercrombie, she's an interesting figure because she's now becoming. Uh, really rigorously rediscovered by artists and, and curators of my generation and younger. Um, uh, she's, uh, her, is, her estate is represented by maybe one of the coolest galleries in New York called Karma, just Karma. Um, and, you know, they're known for representing artists who are in their 30s and 40s, a lot of more, even more emerging uh, figures. And so, you know, kind of what's this artist who begins working in the 1930s in that kind of context? Well, I think Abercrombie is a figure who is really being rediscovered in this moment. So she has this very contemporary feel. She sort of brings art into, from that era into uh, the present in a particular way. And I think that's really echoed in the museum's collection uh, in works by uh, Sarah McEnany, um, a, a work that came in uh, in the mid uh, 2000s, but that uh, kind of interior sense of flatness, that, that focus on this kind of quiet interior, uh, you know, kind of demonstrates, I think, some of Abercrombie's uh, influence, but also um, in a very different way, an artist like Jesse Reeves, um, who is, you know, kind of creating these very weird, surreal uh, objects, but is very much a part of the New York scene uh, that's embracing. Uh, Abercrombie and kind of looking back to the same kind of surrealism that was really uh, informing um, Abercrombie's work uh, back in the day. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really, I think it's a really compelling piece. It has this weird kind of flatness. Everything is almost sort of pushed up to the same uh, plane. Um, there's some sense of a recession into, uh, into the center of, uh, into, into space, but um, and that's certainly, I think, kind of accentuated by the drooping of the glove over uh, the table. Uh, but yet, it kind of has this sort of tension. It kind of pulls you back and forth. It sort of pulls you back into space, but also with that weird way that um, the door and the wall and the floor all seem to be one of the same kind of uh, element uh, that creates, again, throws you back into this flatness. And on the one hand, it has this kind of um, there's a certain softness and femininity uh, in the glove, but also in uh, the rose. Uh, but also, again, it's, 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 it's not a sentimental picture. It's a very, there's, there's a certain coldness to it. There's a certain uh, dry uh, aspect to it. Again, looking at someone like Magritte, who creates that same uh, very uh, sort of flat, dry, understated sensibility. So, um, it's a piece that, uh, unfortunately, we were getting ready to, to put up in the, the Granoff galleries, um, the, our, our kind of 
grandma's attic of, uh, of everything kind of modern and contemporary. Um, and that uh, was halted with the uh, uh, onset of uh, the pandemic, but um, hopefully we'll uh, find an opportunity to get it back up in the galleries and uh, get it on view. Because I think it is really a, a, a wonderful work that does kind of tie together uh, the modern and the contemporary in this very kind of elegant uh, way, not only in terms of the work itself, uh, but also uh, Abercrombie is, in, is really emblematic of one of these figures who is able to um, have worked at a, at a particular moment in time, uh, but uh, continues to, to, to kind of in, inspire and, and feel contemporary uh, in the present moment.